And here's our guest star, like I promised, Kwame Imvalia, the author of Tristan Strong. Yay! Welcome! Thanks, Rick. Thanks for having me. I'm really, really oh. excited to be here. Oh, man, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. You, you are a busy guy. You have uh, a new baby. Yeah? Yes. Congrats. Yeah, congratulations on that. You are reading and writing up a storm. It's been quite a year for you. Uh, I mean, how has this experience been since uh, D D Tristan Strong? It's hard to believe that was your debut. It was so, so solid and so smooth and man, just knocked it out of the park. How has this year been for you? What's the experience been like? Um, you know, it, it's, it's been a lot. It's been exciting. It's been fun. It's been chaotic, uh, strange at times. Uh, definitely now. It's definitely a strange time now. But um, overall, I don't think I would trade it for, for anything, you know, um, being able to, I think, I think the thing that I enjoyed most and the thing that I miss most at the moment was being able to go into schools and talk to students about the book, about writing, about how this was not where I thought I would end up, giving them, you know, seeing all of the aspiring writers in the crowd, like that. That's something I truly miss and something I truly value. Getting, getting to do it virtual is fun, um, but being able to, you know, have somebody come up to you and say, hey, you know, because they're kind of shy, hey, uh, I wanted to write and I thought that maybe you could give me some advice and you give them some advice and then they scamper off and they've got their heads down with the illustrator that they just hired on the spot and it's, it's fantastic. I miss that. Yeah, yeah. No, I hear, I hear that. Yeah, it's been quite a year. You're right. And you know, when I'm looking for something to feel good about, I think, okay, but Tristan Strong is a Coretta Scott King <laughs> honor book, and it's what well, it was it was on the New York Times list for like 13 weeks and counting, and it's you know you've been optioned by uh, the Disney Channel, so there is some good news in this year, and that's there is. Awesome. You know, we we I, I definitely cannot um, complain. I, I I feel bad complaining, and I think there is. There's a lot of joy to be found, you know, and in, in the different things that have happened, both for me and both for Disney, you know, through and, and for the Rick Riordan Presents imprint. Like, I think this first year, you know, and, and some change has been absolutely incredible. Like, I know, I know we had lofty expectations when it first uh, launched, but did you expect like things like this, success like this? No, it's, it's amazing. It's so awesome to see that. Yeah. But, but for you, you... You're wrapping up another series. And as someone who is trying to end their first series, what is that like? What is it like putting the cap on the storyline and the narratives? Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. I mean, I guess, you know, it's, it's like kind of running a marathon. It, uh, not that I've ever done that, but <laughs> that's what I kind of imagine it being. you got to pace yourself. you got to be real sure about you know having enough material and enough uh you know willpower to get to the the finish line it's uh it's a big commitment um so i don't know that there's a secret to it if there is i sure haven't found it yet but uh you just keep plugging um and it's it's been it's been fun i mean 30 books i i just realized that was number 30 that i finished number it's, 30 uh, I, yeah, I don't know, man. <laughs> it's, it's a lot, but, but you, I mean, you, you are, well, the sequel, okay, is, is out this week. It's Tristan Strong Destroys the World. Congratulations on that. I don't, again, I don't know how you do it. You read so much. You've got a young family. You are writing up a storm. You're writing like all the things and Destroys the World is even better than the first Tristan Strong. Um, I, I, don't, I don't get how you do it, but, but for those who haven't, haven't uh, read the book yet, can, can you talk a little bit for us about the themes that you wanted to talk about in, in the second book? Absolutely. Um, I think uh, a lot of the time, at least for me, when I've experienced something, you know, like Tristan Strong punches a hole in the sky, we have a hero who goes through trials and ordeals and faces challenges, consequences for his actions, um, grows, learns, um, and we reach the end of the book. Um, and for a lot of stories, that's kind of it. You know, if you go to the movie theater and you watch a superhero story, we kind of end after the, the good guys triumph, huzzah. 
Um, but for book two, I wanted to explore what really happens afterwards. You know, what happens after the big quote unquote villain is defeated? Um, who fills that void? How do we pick up and recover? Um, what sort of traumas do we face? And what sort of healing is supposed to happen? Because not everyone heals in the same way. Um, and that's something that each and every character has to interrogate. You know, how do we, how do they grow after something as terrifying and monstrous as the Ma'afa and the Iron Monsters and King Cotton, you know, threaten their very way of life? How do they recover from that? Um, but I also wanted to speak about the concept and the theme of diaspora, you know, this, this idea of um, a united people that may have been dispersed throughout the world or throughout the realms in the case of this book and um, how they form that connection or how they rediscover that connection that they have with each other. Um, I think diaspora is something that is big in the African-American community. When you think about origins, how we arrived in the United States, um, what regions of Africa we might have originally been in had you know, we not have been taken away via the slavery. Um, and so exploring diaspora through the eyes of a middle grade, of a middle school student, I think it's something that's very important because you get to see things, um, at least I hope, you get to see things in a different lens, um, understanding if middle grade and middle school is about exploration, being able to explore your connection with someone else, someone who looks like you, I think it's very powerful. Mm, for sure, yeah. I. Yeah, I, I was wondering about that too because you you tackle such um, important and and resonant issues, um, and you mix it so well with uh, a, a sense of wonder and a sense of fun, even, uh, and that's really neat to see. I, is that a difficult balancing act between the adventure and the the humor and and the real serious issues you're talking about? It is, and it's um, it's something that I have become really conscious about. Um, during a recent speaking engagement, I uh, accidentally said out loud and then realized that it was the truth and that uh, we're not, and I am not trying to write a history book. I'm trying to write a story that has elements of history in it um, and for, for readers, young readers and adult readers who might not have um, gotten to experience these same stories the way that I did, but it gives them launching pads and touching points, or anchor points to go delve into actual history books and make that connection. Um, that's one reason I, I really enjoy talking with teachers about Tristan Strong, because we get to talk about writing, we get to talk about story creation, myths, history, we get to talk about all these different facets um, of, of education. And it's not just one thing, it's a unit and it's combined and it allows them to build a lesson around it. And I think teachers, you know, at least the ones that I've talked to, they enjoy that. Yeah, for sure. Um, but, but for you, uh, something that I've always wondered, right, is that you have these stories and, and whether it's Percy or Apollo, you know, they are traveling through all of these different and unique places. And so I have to ask, have you traveled? Like, do you do travel research when you're off, uh, you know, and you're planning these stories? Do you do research into the different locales and locations that your heroes are going to travel to? Yeah, I mean, to an, to an extent, when I started uh, The Lightning Thief, I mean, it was just a bedtime story. So I wanted places that my son could imagine. And we'd taken some trips just around the U.S. I mean, he'd, he'd been to New York like once. He'd been to St. Louis. He loves like Circus Circus and, and Las Vegas. So I had these ideas of I wanted him to see where I was talking about. So that's how it started. And, yeah, I've been to all the places um, in the U.S., I think. A lot of the, the places outside the U.S. I'd never been to before. Like uh, I'd never been to Greece until I completely finished all of the Percy Jackson books, which I always found kind of ironic. And I've, I've never been to Rome when I wrote about Rome. Now I've been really lucky and I've gotten to go to those places. I, I think anytime I go to a place, it, 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 sometimes it's reverse. I'll go to a place and I say, oh, this is cool. This would make a great setting. And then I'll find out that, you know, two, three years down the line, uh, it'll, it'll show up in a book. 
I haven't figured out how to write that out, I'll write that off on my taxes yet, but I, I should probably get on that. <laughs> when you figure that out, let me know too. Yeah, I, I know, right? I think, of course, nobody's traveling a whole lot these days, but it's all Google anyway. Maps. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, do you? I mean, again, I'm going to get back to Tristan Strong too because I, I am so excited about this book coming out. And again, I don't want to spoil it, but. Can you kind of tease favorite characters that the readers might look forward to seeing again? Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, we there are returning characters and there are new characters. And I think, you know, everyone's um, favorite is returning, Gumbaby. Yeah. She, <laughs> Gumbaby makes a return, um, whether it's a triumphant return or just the messy return. You know, I'll let you all be the judge <laughs> of that. But she she returns and, you know, she and Tristan, they still have their um, unlikely but very, very effective partnership. And I think readers will be pleasantly surprised to see what she's been up to and what she gets up to in the book. But in terms of new characters, something that was very important to me was that when I was writing the first book, Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky, I was cognizant of the fact that about Three quarter, midway or three quarters of the way through the book, I realized that a lot of the mythological characters and the gods and the folk heroes were, the majority of them were male. And so I wanted to make a concerted effort to introduce folk heroines and goddesses into book two. So there are some very unique, vibrant, special um, characters that you're going to meet. And one of uh, my absolute favorite ties into the theme of diaspora we spoke of earlier because you can find her stories about her elements of her in as many as 20 to 30 different countries around the world that's how much that's how her stories were, were carried and dispersed um, and she has even given birth to a lot of the legends of you know the original mermaid so I'm really, really, I won't give, I won't give you, you know, her name, but I'm really, when you meet her, you'll know exactly who I'm talking about and you will be hopefully as fascinated as I was when I discovered her. You, you are right about that. <laughs> that <laughs> amazing character. But speaking of characters, you know, I want to talk to you about side characters and that, okay. you know, how you, you have legions of fans dedicated to characters who are not your main character. How do you give uh, your side characters such, you know, life and, and purpose, you know, even though we mo may only encounter them five or six or seven times throughout the story? How do you, you know, inject them with such vibrancy? Yeah, it's, yeah. well, I'm, I'm glad it comes across that way. I'm not always sure I pull it off, but um, <laughs> there are a lot of characters, that's for sure. Um, and part of that comes from, uh, you know, everybody understandably wants to see themselves in a world that they love, you know, so they want to feel like there's a lot of characters out there and characters that are like them and a whole range of characters. So, you know, the demigod world has been slowly and slowly expanding. And in terms of like trying to be equal, yeah, it's tough. I mean, because there are readers who just say, I don't, you know, I just want to see Percy. That's it. And I get that. Uh, but I, I kind of want to give equal billing to some of the other characters, too. I, I do my best to balance. I figure out, you know, okay, well, in this book, we haven't seen Nico D'Angelo in a while. Let's bring him on back. <laughs> or uh, we haven't seen Piper. You know, let's, let's do a story about her. I just try to give everybody, as much as I can, equal billing um, because I love them all. You know, I, once you've made a character, they, I mean, they really are. It's kind of like your children. You know, mm -hmm. you really, really care about what happens to them, even if I do sometimes make their lives difficult. Uh, that's, you know, somebody has to do it. And it might as well be someone who loves them, right? Like, that's, that's right. It might as well be us. If not us, it'll be somebody else. And they won't care as much as we do. There you go. Tough love. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you have the most beautiful backdrop behind you, which, which is from uh, your cover art. And you have such fantastic covers both of the covers just are knockouts can can you talk about how that process and and uh, tell us about the artist and and uh, just yeah tell us about the covers absolutely um i have to give a an extremely um vibrant shout out to my cover artist uh eric wilkerson 
uh, and the design team at Disney, because between the two of them, they have created an absolute masterpiece, both with this cover and uh, with the you know, the sequels cover of uh, Tristan Strong Destroys the World. And, you know, I, I have point zero five percent responsibility for producing these covers. Um, really, really all kudos goes to them. Um, but for the process of selecting the cover, normally, you know, I'll, I'll get a, uh, a request from our lovely editor um, and she will ask and, and say, you know, is there a particular scene that um, you feel kind of encapsulates, you know, the, a lot of the energy of this book? Um, and, and, you know, ask me, you know, what is it? And for, for book one, it was, you know, I had a couple. Um, one of them was a, uh, would have been a spoiler because it comes at the end of the book. And it was uh, when Tristan Strong, for book one, when Tristan Strong um, is surveying uh, the bay at, um, in the Golden Crescent and the Ma'afa is spilling out all of these monsters and he has the story box shining next to him. Um, it would have been a little bit of a spoiler. And so we went with Tristan and John Henry side by side, back to back, battling iron monsters outside of the thicket. Um, it was, I, I, I appreciate it because it was iconic. I feel like Eric Wilkerson did a fantastic job capturing the energy and uh, the action of this scene because I, I love how Tristan is going forward. He's attacking um, and John Henry is in the background and he has Tristan's back because I feel like that's what we um, as adults are supposed to do. We're supposed to let um, our children, the children of the world, you know, be energetic, go forward. And we're just supposed to support them, um, not direct them, but guide them. And for book two, if you've seen the cover, Tristan and a as yet unnamed character who I will not reveal, um, they are sprinting through this incredible landscape where you have giant statues, if you remember them from book one, giant statues that uh, Inyame uses to guard his palace. They're racing through them. You see the shadows of the flying ladies in the sky there is a chaotic energy kind of about the book, which, you know, if two kids racing, that tends to happen, you know? <laughs> and so, again, it was just something where I wanted to show, present a scene where there is, you know, uh, action and energy. But if you look at the, the boys' faces, there's joy and there's fun. And I feel like that's something that has to be present uh, whenever we're talking about, you know, adventures that these two go on. Mm, yeah, that's beautifully said. Yeah. But I'm looking at, you know, your your backgrounds right now, and you have one, two, three, four, five incredible covers there. What, what goes into, like, how do you decide that? How do you decide uh, which scene you're going to present or what's going to go on your cover for your books? Yeah, I mean, I have to shout out to, to my cover artist, too, John Rocco. I mean, he's been the cover artist for the books ever since the uh, the green lightning thief cover that you know, was so iconic. And he does a fantastic job. He sometimes doesn't get a lot to work with. I mean, because our schedule sometimes is so tight. It's like, well, what, what is the book about? It's like, I don't know yet. Just draw something, <laughs> you know, but I'll try to, I'll try to do sort of like you were talking about. I'll pitch a couple of ideas. I'll say, well, okay, in one scene, this is going to happen and another scene. And you're right. You don't want to spoil anything. So you have to be careful about that. And, and he does a great job, just like Eric does, of, of finding an iconic image uh, that may be like not an exact scene in the book, but really represents what the spirit of the book is about. Uh, and I, I, I do appreciate that because it, it doesn't always happen that you have such a great sync up between the book and the cover uh, like yours. And, and, and I think like mine, I, I, we've been very lucky. Do you ever, uh, are you ever writing and, you know, you, you're in the middle of a scene and you're like, this could be, you know, a really good cover or some really good art, you know, for the book. Do you ever, have you ever experienced that? Yeah, I have. I have. I'm, I'm a real visual thinker. So I do, I think, and I'm usually wrong. <laughs> But I'll say, you know, this would make a great illustration. And John's like, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> it's got to be this other. And he's, he's usually right. Uh, that, that's why I'm not the artist, I guess. <laughs> Listen, you know, uh, I was asked to 
uh, provide a example map for book one for the actual map artist to draw. And the two blobs that I turned in that the <laughs> artist turned into the spectacular world of Alki. Yeah, there's a reason I write and, and don't illustrate. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> I understand that. Okay. I got one more question because I have to ask. I'm dying, dying to know if you can give us anything on Tristan Strong 3. I'm dying to, to hear anything, you, any little glimmers that you can give us. What's coming up? Oh, man. This is so tough because, you know, we're here and book two has just, just come out. So I know. It's not fair. You don't want to give spoilers. Um, but what I can say is that I've always, I've always wanted to, from the very beginning, when I was thinking of the magic system for Tristan Strong, and you have this boy who eventually gains the power to see spirits, right? Spirits and ghosts and ancestors. He gains this power through interactions um, in book one. And from the very moment when he gets... Uh, the bead from Isilango and he's able to see the spirits. I wondered what would happen if he took that power, that bead and traveled back to his world. What spirits would he see? Who, uh, what stories would they have to tell um, as he travels back home, you know, from his grandparents' farm? So book three, if, if book one, you know, is about defending against, you know, this, these terrible monsters and book two is about, Get, uh, uh, healing and recovering from trauma and exploring your diaspora. You know, book three, I think, is about returning home and with a, with a new understanding of who you are and what the world actually is around you. Because I don't think you go through those previous two books and come back the same. And so I wonder what ghosts and spirits Tristan will talk to in book three. Okay, you just gave me chills. I have to tell you, I am so, I am so excited. That is awesome. That's all for questions. I think we've had enough questions. Rick, I'm throwing down the gauntlet. I have to give you a challenge. It would not end right if I did not give you a challenge. So here is your challenge. You have to float, float a homemade raft. If you want to make it in the image of Ayana's raft, you can do that. But you have to float a homemade raft across your bathtub, a full bathtub, without any of your characters or figurines falling off. Can you do that? I mean, it sounds doable. So there's probably going to be a huge huge mess up here. I'm trying to figure out how this goes wrong. Okay. All right. I'll figure it out. Challenge accepted. I'm, I'm going to sail through this challenge. Excellent. And remember, gum baby is watching. Oh dear. See, that's what worries me. <laughs> <laughs> Kwame and Balia, thank you so much for joining us today. It was great as always talking with you. Thank you so much for having me, Rick. I really appreciate it. All right. Take care. Well, hello everybody, this is Rick. I am here at the Boston Public Art. Kwame has challenged me to float a raft across a body of water. We don't really have a bathtub, so I come down here because we do have this lovely fountain. Here's my little gum baby. And I have put her on her own little raft. Oh, I can tell this is already going to work really well. So we're going to try to float her across without getting her into trouble. Are you ready, Gum Baby? Gum Baby is not ready. Okay, good. So here we go. Also, Gum Baby does not like Gum Baby's new voice. What did you do to my regular voice actor? Well, sorry, Gum Baby. Okay, so here we go. She's on her raft. She's floating. We can do this, Gum Baby. Gum Baby is not confident. Okay, yeah, that's good. So here we go. Wee, wee. Okay, everything's going great. Oh, no! It's the chicken from Sal and Gabby. It's attacking. Ah, Gum Baby does not like giant chickens. I will fend it off for you. Ah, ah, ah. 
Okay, we got past that. Now, let's keep going. Gun Baby does not like this ride. Yes, I know. Oh no, Gun Baby. Stand up, Gun Baby. Gun Baby is now wet. I know, I know. Okay, we're almost there. We're almost there. We can do this. We can do this. Here we go. We're going across. Look, we've made it like three inches or so. She's really not looking very impressed there. You've almost made it. You're really making good progress there, Gummy Baby. We can do this. Oh no! It's Mr. Yazzie from Race to the Sun, the talking lizard. Ah, it's attacking! Ah, 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 ah. Gummy Baby's face is too fierce. It runs away. Wait, Gummy Baby's kind of going her own way now. Oh, she wants to go that direction. Okay, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Oh no! Through the waterfall. Ah, ah. Gun baby! Gun baby! Ah, ah. Gun baby flies away! Gun baby flies away! Yes! Yes! Gun baby makes it to safety. Oh, that was really close, Gun baby. How do you feel? No comment. Okay. Well, Kwame, I guess we're going to call that challenge sorted.